of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And we just thank him so much for making the trip down. Um, and he's going to be speaking to us tonight about spiritual battles. So. Thank you. I'm Father Closter, as she said, the Diocese of Bridgeport. Better Dane, 26 years. Uh, six years in the Diocese of Bridgeport, 20 years outside the diocese, including eight years in the VA as a hospital chaplain for the veterans, and seven years as a missionary in Ecuador. I've said the Latin Mass for 23 of my 26 years as a priest, and it's a great privilege uh, to be with you, you here tonight. I wanted to talk about spiritual battles, it's something uh, I think all of us have to see in, in light of who we are, and where it is we hope to go. To go all the way back to paganism. The first spiritual battle with the church was with, the, with, with paganism. Uh, you had polytheism, you had the ethnic religions, the Taoism of the Chinese, the Shinto of the Japanese, the Santeria of West Africa and the islands, uh, Hinduism of, of India, the Buddhists of Asia, the Celtics of, of Ireland and Wales, and the Greek gods, of course, we had Zeus, the sky god, Ares, the war god, Athena, the god of wisdom, and the Gallo-Roman god, the god of Mars, of healing, of the sky, Jupiter, of financial gain, and Mercury. So the early church battled against paganism, and it struggled to define what the Trinity was all about. So still to this day, a mystery largely, but yet something we can hold on to as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some of the early heresies that the church struggled against were docetism, said that Christ's body was not human, it was a phantasm, and so the sufferings were only uh, apparent or uh, appeared to be sufferings on the cross. We had Montanism, which was a new uh, prophecies religion and it was based on Montanus, who was an early convert, who had ecstatic visions, and who claimed that the par paraclete spoke through him, that it spoke through not only him, but his two, his two aides, two women, Prisca and Maximilla. Then we had adoptionism, which was a dynamic uh, monarchism, and this dynamic monarchism said that Jesus was adopted as the Son of God at his baptism, or at his resurrection, or at his ascension. He was merely an adopted son. Then we had the Sibelians. Sibelius was a third century priest. Most of our heresies started from priests or bishops. Uh, he said that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were three different modes or aspects of God, but not really three persons. Uh, he believed that there was one person in God, not three. Um, and they were... Uh, it was not a trinity. It was those were. It was one person who was in charge, so to speak, of the other two. And then we get into what I believe are the three major heresies that are still with us today: Arianism. Arius was a Catholic priest of the third century. He said that Christ did not always exist, and that Jesus was not co-eternal with the Father. So, he, even though he believed Jesus to be the Son of God, he thought that he was subordinate to God. He was begotten within time, which made him a no-god. And that's what you hear a lot today, that Jesus was just a pious prophet. He was nothing more. He was not God. Pelagianism. Pelagius was a British aesthetic and philosopher. He rejected original sin. He said all men have the free will to achieve their own human perfection without divine grace. You see this a lot today. I can do it myself. And then finally you have... Uh, Gnosticism. Gnosticism is a personal spiritual knowledge above and beyond the Orthodox Catholic teachings, above and beyond our traditions, above and beyond the authority of the Catholic Church. Um, they, they did not believe in sin and repentance, but they believed in illusion and enlightenment. Uh, these three were and are the greatest enemies of the Catholic Church. Um, St. Jerome, in fact, said that the whole world groaned and was astonished to find itself Aryan. Um, all three of these are in opposition, direct opposition to God, and they are anthropocentric in their nature. We must realize that 
It can be summed up in, 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 in three short sentences. Arianism is Jesus is not God. Pelagianism is my own free will trumps all else. And Gnosticism, my own knowledge trumps all else. When we try to go to the next phase beyond the heresies would be the great Muslim deception. And these were actually wars that we fought. It was called the Bellum Sacrum. Um, only, but remember, only 7% of historical wars were, were religious, even though our opponents try to say that uh, we have been the cause of great destruction and great wars. It's, it's, a, it's a misnomer. Most of the wars have been fight, fought over ideology, our ideologies, not religion. From 1059 to 1291, uh, there were many wars fought to recover Jerusalem. The Crusades were not anything more than trying to recover lands that had been conquered by Muslims, by force. They didn't do it peacefully. They cut people's heads off, they destroyed, they maimed, and they took over historically Christian lands, and we went to recover them. There were eight Crusades, uh, the first one in 1059, and generally the, the Crusades ended, we believe, or we, we concur, in 1291. So the, the first Crusade was in 1290, or 1099, and it was to recover Jerusalem. It was instituted by Pope Urban II. The last was by St. Louis IX in 1270, uh, and then there was another one by Prince Edward of England, 1271 to 1272. And most people believe that the Crusades ended in 1291 with the fall of Acre, or the fall of Jerusalem. There was also in Spain what we call the Reconquista in 1492. This was when Spain expelled all the Muslims and Jews out of Spain. This is not anti-Semitic. Anti the Jews sided largely with the Muslims and were causing great consternation in the Spanish uh, peninsula. And thus they were all expelled uh, by Ferdinand and Isabel in 1492. The 15th century saw other wars against the, the, the Cathars, who were Gnostics, who said they were perfect. Um, they, they believed in the good God of the New Testament, which we hear a lot today, that uh, the, the God of the Old Testament is just fire and brimstone, and the God of the New Testament is, is merciful and just. Uh, and they, they fail to realize that he's one and the same. He never changed. Uh, in in the, the New Testament and these, these cath catharis, uh, they were against marriage and earthly things. So as you can, as you can imagine, the cathars didn't last very long because they, they did not marry. Then we have the Waldens, Waldensians, who were the poor men of Lyon in, in France. They believed in the priesthood of all believers they are largely quoted by modern-day Protestants as their precursors, but they were not Protestants. Uh, they did not consider themselves separate from the church. In fact, when the Waldensians and the Cathars were conquered, uh, many of them came back into the Catholic Church, something the Protestants will never tell you. Uh, the Waldensians rejected the seven sacraments. They have a very low view of baptism and, of course, Holy Communion, the real presence. Then you had the Hussites in Bohemia and Moravia in 1415. Uh, they were in favor of uh, freedom of preaching, that everyone should receive the host in the chalice. And remember, we don't receive the host in the chalice largely because of profanation and because we want to emphasize the fact that you receive both the, the body and blood in each species. When you receive the host, you're receiving the body and the blood. I like to re refer to it as any type of meat you eat. When that is cooked, the blood is cooked inside the meat. You're eating the flesh and the blood of any meat that you consume. It's the same principle with Holy Communion. Uh, the, the Hussites also were in favor of severe punishments of sinners. So they had extreme penances, public floggings. Um, they were very brutal people. Uh, they also believed in the poverty of the clergy, but they were also for the confiscation of church property and trusteeism. 
Uh, they, they believe that the bishops should not be in charge of Catholic property, which leads to all sorts of problems. Yes, sometimes the bishops are unjust with Catholic properties, but overall it's the best system throughout the ages. And finally, I'd like to come into what is known as the Catholic battles against uh, the Muslim invasion of Europe. So the, the first expulsion, of course, was in the West by Ferdinand and Isabel, expelling the Muslims down through the Iberian Peninsula back into Africa. In the Eastern Front, the Muslims got all the way to Vienna, all the way to Vienna in Austria. In, in October of 1571, we had the Battle of Lepanto, one of the greatest naval victories the church has ever has ever seen. Pope Pius V asked all the faithful to pray the rosary, and that's why we get the, the Feast of the Holy Rosary on the 7th of October. On the 7th of October, the Holy League, with about 60,000 troops uh, and fewer, of, uh, fewer galleons, beat 84,000 troops of the Ottomans. They freed 12,000 slaves, 12,000 Christian slaves, and the, the rosary basically uh, saved Catholicism. In fact, Pius V had a vision in Rome that the victory had been won, even though we were, we were outnumbered and we should have lost. The Battle of Vienna. So the Muslims came all the way to Vienna, as far, as far west as Vienna. That battle was fought on September 11th, 1683. Remember that date because we know it well, and it's going to come back as I, as I go through the, through, the, through the last part of this talk. September 11, 1683, King Sobieski of Poland uh, fought against the Ottoman Empire again with about 80,000 troops, and they slaughtered almost all of the 170,000 Ottomans. It was an incredible victory by so King Sobieski. This was 1683. This was over 150 years after the Protestant Reformation. Not one Protestant helped us. It was all Catholic that saved Europe. The Battle of Buda, Budapest, September 11th, 1686. You caught it again, September 11th, 1686. They were, as far as they had been pushed back to Buda, and we were trying to push them back further east. The Holy League had 65,000 troops, and they besieged Buda, which had about 7,000 uh, uh, Muslims inside with 1,000 Jews and 2,000 inhabitants about 10,000 total. And of course, the Holy League stormed the walls and took Budapest, modern day Budapest, back for Catholicism. And finally, we have the Battle of Zenta. Battle of Zenta, modern day Serbia, still further east. September 11th, 1697, three battles. September 11th, uh, all, all three, imagine that. Muslims know this date, Catholics do not. This Battle of Zenta had 50,000 of the Holy League against 85,000 Ottomans. Again, they routed the Ottomans with far fewer troops. This led to the Treaty of Karlowitz in 1699. Uh, this, this treaty meant that never more would the Ottomans come into Europe. They were expelled forever, thank goodness. This led also to the uh, the, to the, the Habsburg do dominance of the Holy Roman Emperor or the, 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 the reign of the Holy Roman Emperor from 1278 to 1918 with Blessed Karl being the final Holy Roman Emperor. The Habsburg Castle is actually in present-day Argau, Switzerland, north-central Switzerland, and uh, when, when the Habsburgs regained the, the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire, they regained Hungary, Croatia, Slovenia, and, and Austria. Uh, they were the rulers, the Catholic rulers, for centuries. We should be thankful for their leadership protecting Europe as they did. Also, we, we must turn to Blessed Charles I, which we had a talk here on August 2nd. He was the Holy Roman Emperor. He was uh, the Holy Roman Emperor of Austria from November 1916 to November 1918, only two years. 
he reunited a huge empire. Hungary, Croatia, Dalmatia, Bohemia, Slovenia, Galicia, northern Spain, Lodomercia, modern-day Poland, Iligria, modern-day Bosnia, and Jerusalem. He also had the title King of Jerusalem. And I wanted to finally end on, on a note of talking about modern-day spiritual battles. We, we've come from this long line, this long history of fighting against anyone who would oppose the church. And we have to see that it really is a fight between demons and angels. The fathers of the church were clear. Any religion that was not Judaism and then Catholicism as the, 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 uh, the inheritor of the, the covenant was demonic. Any other religion was demonic. We have to know that all the other religions were founded by men. There are only two divine founded religions. Judaism, the Old Covenant, and Catholicism, the New Covenant. There is demons versus angels, darkness versus light. And as the, the, the Catechism teaches us, and we, we hear in Holy Scripture, there is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the three downfalls of man. We constantly have to battle against these throughout our life. The lust of the flesh is sexual temptation. The lust of the eyes is power, money, and prestige. The pride of life is self-aggrandizement, or trying to prop yourself up to be the end-all and the be-all. Remember, within these, there is a battle for purity. Guard your eyes, men. Guard your sensibilities, women. The battle for religion, to have an increase in character, poverty, and moral levity. That we are moral beings who are poor in spirit and have a character that is unassailable. We must battle for the spiritual advancement of the Catholic Church. That all men may hear and know the possibility of their eternal freedom. This is achieved by frequent confession. I put that first on purpose. It is the most humiliating of the sacraments and perhaps the most necessary behind Holy Communion. Devout communions, devout with a heart that realizes that we're not worthy to go up there and receive, and yet we do. The angels are a bit envious of us because we are not as pure as they are because they're in heaven and yet we can receive the body and blood which they cannot we are the crown jewel of creation as human beings our time before the blessed sacrament is imperative our times of meditation even if only for a minute or five minutes a day i found that even in a large crowd i can check myself out for 30 seconds to a minute and have interior time with people talking, people all around me. They don't know I'm doing it, but I can still do it. The battle to become more humble in the eyes of our Lord. Your opinion of yourself is often too high. The opinion of others of you is often too low. God's is right on. Satanism is real. Tarot cards, fortune tellers, seances, Ouija boards, yoga, they're all gateways to Satanism. Make no mistake about it. The church is our antidote. We've had our Judases, but we've also had our saints. Remember that any time you see a bad bishop or a bad priest or a bad Catholic, it doesn't bes besmirch the church. It besmirches them. The church is much greater than any of us and our faults. The church is much, much holier than uh, any of us and our faults. We must realize that once we're confirmed, we are soldiers for Christ. We take up our sword, which is the rosary. We take up our shield, which is the scapular. And we are equipped 
to fight against principalities and demons. Never underestimate what you've been given. We as Catholics are the standard. We as Catholics lead others in battle. We are the nobility through our baptism. Not in a conceited way, but in an actual way. And the serfs are those who are unbaptized. We have to protect them as much as we can. Pray for them, hope for them, and welcome them into the church. Welcome to entertain any questions you might have. Absolutely. And um, the, the, the tradition of the church teaches that everyone gets a guardian angel, a priest gets two, and a bishop gets three. Um, the guardian angels are very, very important. Uh, make them your friend. I would, I would uh, definitely try to discern a name or some, something you could call your guardian angel. It must be a very um, personal relationship that you have with your guardian angel. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, um, like, what happened in, in, in 1997 on September 11, 1997? Okay. Because uh, I remember that um, in September 11, when, uh, when, when, as we, uh, as we did 9-11, when the uh, plane went into the World Trade Center. Right. So, how was it 9-11, September 11, in the history? Yeah, it's 2001 that it hit the plane. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, 2001. 97 was another bomb attack, but it was, I don't think it happened on September 11th. What day was that? Do you, does anyone remember? 97. 22nd, 1993. 90, yeah, it was 93. Yeah, 22nd. Yeah, so that that September 11th was because they know that date, um, and whether it was the Mossad or the Jew, or, or sorry, or or the Muslims, the Jews or the Muslims, we don't know, but that was definitely done on purpose. Yes, you had a question. No. Well, what, what, do, we, do we know what the significance of that date is to the Muslims? Yeah, they're, they're, they, they, they were defeated three times on that date. Anybody else? Okay. Well, very good. I'm, again, I'm Father Closter. Yes. Hi, um, so I saw something. This, sorry, this was the, the conversation back to Harrison, but I was reading this Transgenderism is like a subversion of transubstantiation because in transubstantiation the accident will always stay the same, but the substance changes. But it's the opposite way. For you know, um, so th this is all connected because the demons they they try to subvert sexuality any way they can. So um, transgenderism, any type of uh, of, of gay activity. Any type of carnal sexual activity is something that demons are very, very interested in. Um, there's, there's a connection between child trafficking, uh, pornography, sex, the, the, whole, the whole enchilada, and the black mass. So the black mass, they need a consecrated host. They don't steal it from Protestants. They don't steal it from anyone outside the church. They steal it from us. They defecate on it, they urinate on it, and they perform sexual acts with it. Within the black mass, which is the inversion of our white mass, our holy mass. Yes. Uh, Father, just going off of that, the, um, going back to the, um, when you're introducing the heresies, I just want to know to what extent is, like, say, movements within Protestantism and other, like, Christian movements we see in the so-called Restorationist Church, like the Mormons or, like, the others, to what extent are those, like, heresies sort of uh, repackaged? And like whether it be Protestantism, Mormonism, or they they all they all have uh, one or more imperfections, one or more steps away from the church. So the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness wouldn't even be Christian because right. they don't believe in the Trinity. The the mainline Protestants uh, have at least one or more. Well, actually they have they have at least two or more uh, diversions from the Catholic Church. 
The Orthodox are our closest friends. Uh, theirs is not a, a doctrinal divergence other than the creed. It is more a juridical divergence uh, as, in that they do, not re- they do not recognize the central authority of the first among equals with the Holy Father. Yes. What now? Mary Mary. Yes. Oh, marriage. Marriage. Yes. So, um, when 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 someone marries outside the church, uh, that that marriage uh, is is considered a mixed marriage, and you have to get a dispensation to marry someone outside the church. Um, it used to be very difficult. Now they made it pretty easy. I discourage that uh, for the simple reason that sometimes it works, but the majority of times it doesn't. And it, it many times it leads the Catholic spouse somewhat away from the church. I've seen I've seen cases where the two get married. I had one case they got married in the Catholic Church. Neither one was practicing their faith. The husband started practicing his Catholic faith. The wife started practicing her Lutheran faith, and it was a constant, constant battle. It was horrible the, the stuff I heard and the stuff they went through it's just one more thing to argue about and in going into a marriage there's so much to argue about <laughs> it's good to eliminate one of those one of those things and that would be to have the same faith yes so say we have a battle with deism and some battles in this world how much influence do we He's asking about how much influence the demons have on us. Um, they can have as much influence on us as we allow. We stay close to the sacraments. We stay close to our Lord. They have no power over you, and they will be very easily banished. The more you're wishy-washy, the more they can creep in, and the harder it will be for an exorcist, for example, to get rid of them. I've heard exorcists say that in our age, it's getting more and more difficult to exercise them the first time. Okay, engagement of, of uh, non-Catholics. I would say the the the. the the biggest thing, if you're a complete stranger to them, then the, the sky's the limit. Talk about whatever you want. If you're related to them, if you've ever been in an argument with them, never broach the subject unless they do. Because they have been offended by you in your arguments. If they're a relative, don't ever talk about religion unless they bring it up. Pray for them. Pray for their conversion. Especially pray that God puts a stranger in their life who is incredibly good at apologetics, knows their faith, and can convince them. It's going to be a stranger if it's a relative. If they're somewhat, uh, if they're, they're somewhat not a friend of yours, then you have a really good shot at talking to them. But I would say the best thing you can do is be a good example and let them come to you. There will be opportunities. If they're your friend, they're going to ask you eventually. And that's when you have to be prepared. Don't, don't, don't force yourselves on them. You'll push them the other way. Yes. You were talking about how demons can kind of infiltrate their way in even if they find just a small crack. Well, I'm fine now with the lack of holy water in the churches. That's a huge wide door. Yes. Bringing all this in with us. Yes. Germs are not evil. No. They are God created. Right. But all spirits are other than the one. Right. And that's what we could be bringing in with us. Where do you think this is going? So holy water. Um, is someone going to come back? We no. Find find a traditional priest. Um, we found a way around it in my parish at St. Marguerite's of Britain in uh, in Brookfield. Um, he he had, and you can buy the your pastor can buy these. Uh, they're made of wood. They say holy water on them. 
and you stick your hand under, and it's like a, a dispenser for the for the sanitizer, and it puts the holy water in your hand, and you, you touch nothing. And that way, the bishop can't say that we're being unsanitary. So you can find ways around it. Other other things you can do, find a priest, bring him a big jug of water, have him bless it. It's got to be blessed in Latin with the exorcisms. That's the only holy water the demons are afraid of. No exorcist in his right mind would use holy water that he just waved his hand over. He's going to exercise it. He's going to say it in Latin. With salt. But even just with dispensary. Yeah. Where with, you can fill in the box. Like, why, with, why is all of this gone? Find, and, yeah, find, find a priest who... There's plenty of priests here in the archdiocese. Uh, there's priests in, uh, in all... The, you can find a priest who will do it for you. Yes. I would explain, like... Kind of asking like, what uh, Omar said about demons. Like, how would you describe them? Because like, we all kind of... I guess we see, like, an imagery. Like, they're like the guys with, like... The, or whatever, like, the, like, are they rather influences or like, like they're physical, they're not physical people, but they're spiritual elements, right? Like, how so, do you, so demons, like, what's the best way to describe that? And, demon, he's talking about demons, uh, the manifestation. A demon is as a pure spirit, but you can see them, you can know they're there, they can even appear to you in bodily form. Um, believe me, if you've ever seen a demon, you'll know it, <laughs> and if you haven't, you're blessed. Yeah, there is a demon assigned to every sin, and uh, Satan himself often will come to back up a demon if the demon feels threatened, if the demon is in danger of being expelled. Satan will throw his weight behind that demon. Um, how would you explain like uh, spiritual warfare for yourself? Like, like what like, difficulty praying? Most people don't really need to worry about uh, demons. The, but the important thing to remember is to arm yourself. You, you arm yourself with holy water, holy communion, the sacramentals, the sacraments. And the two you can receive the most, the most often, confession and communion. And the demons know that we are marked with baptism. They see it. They see it illumined on our heads. Uh, they also see when our so-called illumination is faltering. Why did the Pope bring in a, a, a false idol into the Vatican and put it on the altar of St. Peter? Why, why did he do that? Why that's, did the that's Pope... inviting demons. Why did the Pope bring yeah, the Pachimama? You'll have to ask him. I don't know. That was very foolish. Okay. Okay, last question. You know, one thing you may notice is sometimes uh, when the children are being interviewed by other means, um, you know, practices that are in teachings that are in the weather in schools, whether it's teaching about, you know, transgender ideology or some of these, you know, social yoga, or in some cases maybe they'll have like a Freemason that was in their family, right? Um, so let me ask, in that case where, let's say the, the child is exposed to that, it's necessarily like, it's not really under his own consent, uh, would you recommend any um, spiritual remedies for that individual? What should anything that they should do in particular? Yeah, so even even with a child, if the child is of the age of reason, he still has to cooperate, he still has to want the demon to come in. He's talking about children being exposed to demonic activity. Um, there there are prayers for children. Um, there there uh, would be uh, a blessing for children. There would be spiritual remedies in the sacraments and the sacramentals, just like for an adult. Um, any one over the age of reason, which is normally six to seven years old, anyone could give themselves over to demons. And I've had people, I had a woman tell me one time, you know, her son was eight years old and was acting horribly. She said, well, he's only eight. He doesn't know what he's doing. I said, I'm sorry. He's eight years old. Look in the Old Testament. Look at Elijah. There were young boys who were making fun of him. He called out she-bears to kill them. Young boys, probably around the age of eight or nine. Yes, they're capable of great evils. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Bob.
Oh, look. It's me. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, let yeah. me put the spotlight on. I knew he was, I knew he was coming. I knew you were coming. And I ladies made. and gentlemen, if you haven't given us your email address, just make sure in that green binder you write down your email for us. And this is Father Connolly, our pastor here. Yes. <laughs> hello, hello. I've been with you. I've been with you once before. I just arrived at this parish in July, but I'm so very happy that a wonderful initiative like this um, utilizes this magnificent space that we have here at Most Holy Redeemer. Um, so I'm so happy that you're here, and I just want to reiterate, as I have uh, the last time I was able to speak to you all, and as I make very clear to, to Debbie, who does such a wonderful job, that you're always welcome consider this, you know, your spiritual home away from home, and uh, it's just a tremendous initiative. We need more initiatives like this, and we need more um, faithful souls like you. So you have my prayers, my deep affection, and my welcome always. If you want to come back uh, tomorrow, <laughs> you'd be most welcome for that as, as well. Um, I'm so glad you do this on the first Fridays, but we just began the first Saturday's devotion. So Our Lady, when she came to Fatima in 1917, asked that honor be rendered to her Immaculate Heart on five consecutive first Saturdays of the month. By receiving communion, praying the rosary, going to confession, and meditating for 15 minutes. So tomorrow we're going to have a solemn high, traditional Mass at noon. It'll be a votive Mass to honor Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. We'll pray the Rosary after that Mass and we'll sing the Fatima hymns. We're even going to wave the handkerchiefs like they do at the Copa de Iri and Fatima. That brings joy to the heart. And then after Mass we're going to have a little reception here in the garden where we're going to serve the Pastéis de Nata, which is the Portuguese pastry. So in keeping... Um, with the Fatima theme. So if you want to join us tomorrow or the other first Saturdays, uh, October, November, December, and January, please do. And uh, thank you for being here on the first Friday evenings. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Father Kloster. Um, I appreciate so much uh, you taking the time to, to join uh, the Goretti group. And uh, you're in our prayers. Enjoy each other's company. Thank you.